Just a quick word of warning before we get going that the following podcast will almost certainly contain spoilers and may also contain strong language and conversations of an adult nature. Hello and welcome to episode 7 of Strong Language and Violent Scenes, the podcast given a second chance to films that might not deserve them. I'm Mitch Bain, I'm a film composer and the founder of ShockStreetHorror.com. And I'm Andy Stewart, I'm a filmmaker and a journalist and other things as well. Yeah, Other, other miscellany. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very happy to be joined by a guest uh, Skyping in again today. We have got, uh, well you may know him as Dr. Herbert West and reanimator of the musical. You may know him from Beyond the Gates or The Mind's Eye or Almost Human or... Most recently, the director of the Shutter exclusive sequence break, delighted to be joined on the line tonight by Mr. Graham Skipper. Graham, hello. Hello, thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. I'm wearing my Reanimator t-shirt and reverence. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get straight in, Graham. Uh, so you have, uh, you've chosen an M. Night Shyamalan movie tonight, and uh, <laughs> uh, Andy touched on this in the mini episode, that when someone came on with an M. M. Night Shyamalan film, we didn't necessarily expect it to be this one right away. But um, you've gone for The Village, so to kick off, why why did you choose this? Why did this come to mind? Because you came at us with a really good shortlist. Why did this win out over the others? You know, I remember when I first saw The Village. I saw it in the theater because I've, I've always been a big M. Night Shyamalan fan. I know that he uh, certainly, you know, his films have some problems. And, you know, some of his later movies maybe aren't as good as the earlier ones. However, I've always loved that M. Night Shyamalan is totally unafraid to go bonkers with his <laughs> ideas. Okay. Um, he goes big and he goes bold and he plays around with tone. And I think his stuff always looks really pretty. So I was in college. And when I, I saw it in the theater and I remember I loved it. I immediately went out and I bought the DVD and then I was like shocked to talk to like all my friends and hear that everybody hated it. And then I read all these reviews and everybody fucking hated it. And then in the years since, everybody keeps talking about how much they hate this movie. And I, I just remember going, I, I, I don't understand why people hate this so vehemently because it seems to me that the main complaint about it is with the twist ending, which we can like talk about Shyamalan and his twist ending. <laughs> yeah. um, and while I think that, you know, some of his endings are executed a little bit better than some than other ones, I always felt like this one fit, you know, even rewatching it yesterday, I felt like it, it sort of helps add layers to the overall story. And and so, yeah, I, I just I feel like it's a, a really good movie and a really complex movie. And I feel like people kind of remember it from that point in time where they were waiting for another moment of M. Night Shyamalan like slamming them in the gut with another ending like he did with The Sixth Sense rather than looking at his movies as just like a story that he's telling. On the story front and on the technical front, I think The Village is really excellent. Yeah, I feel uh, he maybe suffered a little bit from um, people expecting and hunting down his uh, twist a little bit too much. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. I, I think that he, I mean, unfortunately, you know, because his first two movies, right, it was Sixth Sense followed by Unbreakable. Yeah. And in both of those movies, you know, he he hits us with a really what I think are really good, like sort of twist endings. But then he gets so pigeonholed, you know, into, you know, people expecting if you're going to see a Shyamalan ending, man, he's going to totally turn your head around with <laughs> whatever the ending's going to be. And and so I think that it kind of, you know, hamstrung him a bit in terms of storytelling where he kind of had to put a twist ending in, <laughs> but he also was never going to be able to put in something that would satisfy what people were expecting yeah yeah um i, I mean I, you know i get it. I, I, I absolutely agree with that the hamstringing and i feel that maybe that's why a lot of people had a problem with the ending of this because it feels a bit more shoehorned in and a bit sloppier yeah yeah i agree i mean look you know the village is, is definitely not a perfect movie i what, what i will say that i like about the ending is i think that it adds a layer of like almost making the the elders i mean i don't, I don't know how you want to get into this <laughs> you know if you want to just like get into 
into the the meat of the story or whatever. But for me, you know, I obviously the twist is sort of at, at the center of this movie. And I think that the one thing that the twist does add is for me, you know, upon rewatching it, it kind of makes the elders who are really these like benevolent people throughout the whole movie. It kind of makes them like sociopathic or like <laughs> kind of evil by the end. I think it kind of you know? absolutely. Yeah. When you yeah. get towards the th- when you get to the third act, which uh, I mean, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but that's fine. But like, I think that when you get getting towards the third act to think that the elders come off kind of really uh like really discompassionate and kind of like yeah it's yeah it's sort of like it's well you think back to the opening shot you know and here's this guy burying his son and you're going shit you knew that all that was out there and you knew that your son could probably because i believe his son brennan gleason and his son yeah. died of like an, uh you know a disease or something i'm going man you let your son die for an ideal you know and that's intense like that's a big thing and and i think that those are areas where like Shyamalan maybe could have delved a little bit deeper i mean you know the the movie's not very long um it, it moves you know for being like a period drama it moves along at a pretty brisk pace <laughs> it definitely does um, yeah you know which, which i think is good but i think that there there is a little bit of room like this is a movie that that feels really big and so i think there's a little room especially with it being so ensemble driven um where he maybe could have you know really like dug into you know that idea of like my god you know what have we done and and you know what are the consequences but because they don't they don't at all it's very it's very much uh business as usual uh, at the end yeah it's very yeah it's totally like you know well great we can continue our ruse and i i think that a lot of people sort of look at that as a a sign of like bad like script writing and maybe it is i don't know what i read into it though is that it's i don't know watching it yesterday it made me reflect a lot on like what's going on in america right now with this very strong staunch like conservative movement Mm -hmm. that is so so tied to trying to live in the past and resist anything that's progressive that it sort of made me reflect on that a little bit and go you know these elders you know the people that started this village you know they they had good intentions you know they wanted to preserve innocence and they wanted to protect their descendants from the evils you know that are part of modern society but in doing so they robbed their descendants of the freedom of choice to do what they want to do and i think that that's you know harmful and that's dangerous and yet you know even after we've discovered that you know discovered the big reveal and like we know oh it's modern society and and whatever that even after all of that still nothing changes yeah that still the people in power decide we're going to keep things this way because we like it and and we're going to trust our children to follow in our footsteps and i think the only source of kind of light here is that ivy knows that there is kindness on the other side of the wall okay yeah. you know oh yeah <laughs> much yeah i mean um i think it's it's interesting i would not have considered it at all really what you said about it being kind of like it feels timely now in a way that it probably hadn't for quite a long time particularly in america yeah i mean and and maybe you know it's it's totally possible that Shyamalan did not think about that at all while he was writing it but <laughs> that, is, just, that is possible <laughs> you know yeah. um but it just kind of struck me you know watching it now just going man it's it's so complex this idea of wanting to like shield people from you know from the things that you're afraid of but then you know that fear causes you to you know look past all the other stuff that's good you know they're so afraid of like their relatives that got killed back in the 80s or whenever it was they chose to start this commune but they're not looking at you know the kind people like the the dude that you know rescues ivy on the other side of the wall so anyway it just kind of it just kind of i don't know it resonated on that level for me this time and Yes, I don't know. Just sort of an interesting observation. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna cycle back to that in a sec. Um, before we do, there is something that we tend to do with guests that come on and choose a movie. Andy, can we get thirty seconds on the clock? Yes, indeed, that's already done. Cool. So, um, Graham, for the benefit of anyone who either hasn't seen this before or needs their memory jogged, thirty second synopsis. You good to go? Yeah. Right. Three, <laughs> two. One, go. So the village is about a uh, community that lives uh, uh, within the bounds of a forest uh, that they cannot go into because there are monsters in the forest that will eat you if you go out there. Um, And if there's anything of the color red that is inside of your village, then the monsters will come and get you. So they're afraid of that, so they can't leave the village. Um, And meanwhile, there's a love story between the blind ivy and uh, the silent, stoic Joaquin Phoenix um, (laughs) and her friend, the very simple... Uh, mentally handicapped oh. Adrian Brody. Oh, I've got to stop it? you, Graham. Got to stop you there. 
We are out of wow. time, unfortunately. There, thirty seconds. That was fast. Thirty seconds so, disappears yeah. quickly, doesn't it? Right. So at least I at, le at least I got to mentally handicap Adrian Brody. Yeah, I think that, oh. <laughs> which, I, which I think ends up being ends up being vital. I think. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I want to come on and talk about that a little bit. Yeah, as, yeah, as we prog as we progress through. Uh, yeah. So I think I think like um we should just I think we should just jump right into this thing. And before we get into the, the cast of this is insane. Like right, like if this came out in 2018, the cast would read like the cast of an Oscars movie. Absolutely. Oh yeah. It's insane. I mean. The, uh, even down to your ancillary characters, it's crazy. Well, you've got Jesse Eisenberg's in there, and his sole job. I know, I had forgotten he was in this. <laughs> his sole job is to stand on a log. Like he's, I love it. He, I love it. He doesn't have hellish much to do. Fran Kranz's in there. Michael Pitt's in there. All in really like minor roles, and these guys all yeah. went on to be names. Yeah, absolutely. Judy Greer in a, a career downturn, I think. Probably performance-wise, I yeah, think probably, probably one of the worst things I've seen Judy Greer in. Oh but, no, but not, uh, my least favorite Judy Greer performance, I would say. Okay. Potentially. Okay. Sorry, Mitch. <laughs> Brendan Gleeson in a role, quite a small role, quite a. Um, but a but a but a powerful one. I think he's. He, I think he's quite good in this. I think that he he sort of uh, has that. He balances like the grief of losing his son with the the like stoic you know elder figure that he has to be like as a sort of a governor of this community. I, I especially you know towards the end his like little bit about about we've got hope. Like I, I think he's quite good. I mean I think he's great in everything. But yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he, he really resonated with me. He's probably one of the more conflicted characters, like because mm -hmm. obviously, yeah, you, like you say in the opening scene, am I right in saying it's it's his kid that's died, isn't it? That is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. um, yeah. So later on, I think when you have Bryce Dallas start the Ivy character, kind of having to go against the wishes of the elders to go and get the medicines from the towns and whatever, I think that him kind of knowing or understanding the greater good of that, being at odds with the kind of community values thing, probably makes him while he doesn't have that much to do on screen is probably one of the more interesting characters in it yeah i would agree yeah i think that um john hurt is really interesting in it yeah john hurt's john hurt's great i think he's william he's hurt, right? oh, sorry william, william hurt. hurt yeah fuck yeah sorry sorry yeah. Uh, john yeah. william yeah <laughs> although john uh, hurt is also awesome uh <laughs> he is also awesome yeah RIP. uh yeah i think i think he's great in this i think that he especially that monologue at the end that he gives about you know why he chose to do what he did it's just really powerful, you know, and, and all of these performances, too. One thing I noticed is that, you know, Shyamalan shoots all of this in long single takes. So everything is really performed out, you know, fully. There's not a lot of like cutting to find a performance. It's, it's more like theatrical in a way, which I think I think benefits their performances, because I think these, you know, actors are able to really like get, you know, dig in their heels and, and uh, kind of get to the, the meat of what they're talking about. Um, so I appreciate that Shyamalan did that because um, I, I think it helps the movie. I mean, the DOP is Roger Deakins on this yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right? I know. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Yeah, and then we kind of come to our three, I guess our three kind of main characters, if you like. Uh, you've got Adrian Brody. Noah? Noah Percy, yeah. I feel he, he's pushing it again down the... Uh, down the Tropic Thunder, Simple Jack Road. I think it's it, a little bit. It's yeah, a little bit. I yeah, know it almost gets there. It's yeah, borderline. It's I think, pushing, yeah. It, pushing it a little bit. Uh, and uh, we've got Bryce Dallas Howard, who, yeah, she may or may not be blind. Yeah, I, I couldn't figure that out at all. And then you've got, as you said, a very stoic performance from Joaquin Phoenix. Border, bordering yeah, sort on... Of an interesting... <laughs> yeah, he's... I think Joaquin's performance is pretty interesting in that, like, it's it's weird. He's, he's almost our hero for, like, most of the movie. Yeah. Until he gets stabbed yeah yeah and i think it's sort of interesting that especially back into i mean I, I i would expect this more now with with sort of this wave of um you know really strong like central female characters but i think back in 2004 it was a little less you know likely that you might see such a strong female hero like you do in bryce dallas howard who who then despite being blind you know as william hurt says you know she's more capable than most people in this village yeah. And that she's the one that has to go through this terrifying journey. And she's the one that has to, you know, really take up the mantle of being the leader of this community. So I think it's a really interesting choice by Shyamalan to do that. And I, I like that choice. And, you know, Adrian Brody, it's it's hard because I think he's really, really good in this. Yeah. And I think that it's really hard to play that kind of a role. Yep. That's such a hard job and still make it believable and yeah. still make it heartbreaking at the same time, which I think he's able to do. Yeah, the scene, I, the scene in particular where Bryce Dallas Howard and him in the the barn after he stabs Joaquin Phoenix, 
That's pretty yeah. hard. That's a pretty harrowing moment. That's one of the heavier. Uh, that's one of the heavier moments in there. Yeah, I think. it's pretty. It's pretty harrowing. Yeah, I agree. It's, especially when she leaves and you can just hear him in there, kind of wailing and crashing around. It's pretty rough. Yeah, it's it, it's sort of like he had to play like an infant. Yeah. It, with with all these emotions that are so right there at the surface, and it makes it even more conflicted when you sort of think back and you realize, oh shit, well he's also been the guy that's been skinning all these animals. He's been the guy that's been tormenting people, and he's ultimately mm-hmm. the guy that you know not only tried to kill. Joaquin but then also tried to kill Bryce Dallas Howard yeah yeah Yeah. you know and and it's sort of like I I can't figure out if that is a sort of manipulative uh like something that Shyamalan did to to make us really question how we felt about him or if it's kind of I I wonder if it would have been stronger for it to have just been like like if Jesse Eisenberg had been the guy. Yeah, I I did find myself questioning the the logic behind making him kind of mentally disabled. I thought I I wanted I I kind of found myself questioning why is he going down that road? Because I mean, at the end of the day, it's very much a love triangle, and it would have worked just as well with a I don't know an able bodied person. Is that what you could? What do you say? Is that is that the the nomenclature? Sure. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I I think that he did it. I think he chose that because it's a red herring like yeah. if it were say it was jesse eisenberg right and we knew that he was like friends with with ivy you know i i could see us sort of going like oh okay here's a guy that's also in love with ivy whereas like for me i never really looked at at noah as as sort of being capable of love i saw i he's he's a child and so when you have this you know layer that they add in of of oh he's in love with Ivy that's why he you know that's why he stabs Joaquin that's why he goes after Ivy it sort of like hits you upside the head which honestly might be a little bit why the big twist of like finding out it's present day at the end is maybe a little a little more muted is because we've already had this big twist Noah's the guy because we like Noah we feel bad for Noah you know yeah I think Um, sympathy yeah yeah well, I feel I've had my question answered. Uh, Graham, just a quick one. I know you said that you watched this when it came out and you watched it last night. Have you watched it a lot over the years? Like, have you gone back to it much? I, I have occasionally. You know, it's funny. I have this uh, giant binder with something like 500 DVDs in it that at some point when I was moving, I just tossed out all the, you know, all the boxes and just put all the discs and sleeves. Yeah. And occasionally when I'm flipping through that, I'll come across the village and I'll put it on. So I've probably seen this movie, I mean, since it came out four or five times, maybe. Okay. Um, I'm um, yeah, I, I, you know, this was my second watch for me. Well, now third, it, but uh, yeah, I, I definitely haven't watched it in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, it was interesting to rewatch it, especially like you guys were talking about with the cast and going, "Oh my god, this cast is nuts!" Because <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like, say, like, even the people who are in who are in this for like a few minutes, like the, you like Michael Pitt, mm-hmm. they were on like then there was yeah. like Funny Games, Boardwalk Empire, and a whole bunch of things. Like yeah, on rewatch, because I mean, I would say that if this came out. 14 years ago this is my first watch in say 13 years and yeah. it's insane yeah. when you look yeah. like because the cast was impressive then but now it's unbelievable yeah i saw it in the cinema but i found myself having more problems with it now i think when you're in the cinema things don't necessarily percolate and then when you add 14 years on top of that it becomes particularly muddy um but when i watched it again twice back to back i found myself a bit yeah, I had some problems with some of it. Expand. I'll expand as we get to the pieces, Mitch. Okay, okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, no, I hear you. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those movies that I, I'm not going to say it's a masterpiece. Like, it's certainly not. Oh, but trust me, we've I, never had a masterpiece on this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was thinking about, you know, a movie that's always maligned, you know, that people don't like, that I've always liked and I've mm-hmm. always found value in, this, this just popped into my head because I feel like the response to this is so like vehemently like this is a piece of garbage movie or at best you know when i would talk to people they would say oh i like the first half you know or oh i like the first two thirds but the ending falls apart for me and i don't know you know watching it again this time i went this is ultimately like a period drama love story you Mm -hmm. know i think that a lot of the problems people have with it is that it's billed as like a straight horror film yeah or even Um, even a hard thriller yeah you know it's and, and there's elements of that i mean i remember and obviously this this reading changes once you know the ending, but that first sort of like attack on the village when the monsters, you know, come out. Yeah. I think that sequence is so masterfully done that if you don't know what the monsters really are and you're seeing these strange like sort of porcupine creatures, you got to remember that that the you know, at that point, this is a mythology that's been totally created out of the blue. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't know anything about them. 
it, it's it's totally unknown. The people are fucking terrified, <laughs> and you're going, my God, what are they going to do if they don't get inside? Well, you would you be. Know? You and, would be if those things were creeping around. Those are fucking pretty scary. Yeah, good looking, yeah. good looking yeah. creatures in there. Pretty decent creations, and then when you find out later that they're suits that the residents of the town have built, they're even more impressive. <laughs> yeah, it's like damn. They really put some effort into this. Yeah, it's, um, like, it's like no electricity, <laughs> but the practical effects are great. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I, I think that when you first view it, it, it's a lot more scary and it's a lot more tense mm-hmm. because you don't know what these monsters are going to do. Then when you go back and you rewatch it, for me, it, it shifts into becoming way more of this love drama. And I think, too, there's the added layer of the elders sort of culpability and everything. Because you know, when you think about it, Noah would never, you know, have I, I, wouldn't, I won't say never, but Noah would not have donned that red suit and would not have pretended to be a creature had the elders not created the creatures in the first place. True, he had, um, some, he had something to hide behind. Yeah, he had something to yeah. hide behind. And I think that when he found it, you know, because they said, oh, he must have found this in our floorboards, that, <laughs> yeah. you know, which, I mean, <laughs> but I think, you know, when they're saying that, I was going, well, I could, I could understand how somebody of his, like, sort of mental handicap finding that and knowing probably this is like, a, this is a monster, but not being able to sort of compute what happened versus, like, Ivy, who feels the monster suits, and it's sort of kind of instantly able to understand, oh, okay, that's why you do this. Right, so um, as Ivy yeah, I blind, what is, I it, don't, that, what is the sure, deal? I'm not sure why she's blind. I, I, I wonder if it's a parallel to Noah's handicap, I think is, is kind of the idea. I think it also makes her, <laughs> I think it makes her an easy person for her father to send yeah. into the forest and like out into the world because she's not going to be able to see the car. But I'm you still know. I'm still not one hundred percent convinced. Does she, she talks at one point about being able to see colors or something? Yeah, that's a little muddy. Yeah, that's a little muddy. But I'm still not convinced uh, she's one hundred percent blind. She's an extremely confident runner. She is. She is she, a very confident runner. Yep. She yeah. has a foot race with Noah. <laughs> There's all sorts of all sorts of unseen dangers in the field. There could be mole holes, uh, <laughs> numerous potholes. She navigates them. The with, trucks, hey, yeah, yeah, the, yeah the, there's jagged trees that they've fashioned to keep out monsters. She navigates it all with no problem. <laughs> I I question her uh, her blindness. And she, there's points where she's making clear eye contact with people. She's never <laughs> she's never doing that weird kind of looking off thing like, uh, what's her name? Emily Watson does in Red Dragon. Okay, where, yeah, yeah. But she's not making eye contact. She's constantly staring at people i think she's at it <laughs> that would be the real twist <laughs> that, <I'm gonna> say, <laughs> that a... like it's, it's in, a, in a shamalan film it's not it's not beyond the realms of possibility <laughs> it's not what i will say though is i think in response to your question of why is she blind if we assume that she is indeed blind shamalan here is trying to write a parable you know he's trying to write you know a fable right yeah. so he's giving us i sort of imagine it like somebody sitting down and saying you know well there was this village and there were the elders, and there was a, a you know a blind woman and a silent man and a simple man, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and he's okay. kind of, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and, absolutely. And it's yeah. I I, I, th- I feel like that's kind of where Shyamalan's coming from, and I agree with you that I don't think it logs like perfectly. Yeah, and I yeah, think maybe it doesn't, it doesn't track all the way. I don't think. It doesn't track all the way, but I, I'll, I'll say two things to that. I've one, I've always been a film goer that I I I, I am willing to give benefit of the doubt a really far reach you know like okay, I'm, okay. I'm i'm generally i don't i don't think too much like i read these you know like like i love the last jedi right and i read all these think pieces about well you know the bombs wouldn't have dropped like that in space <laughs> <laughs> you know or the the ship could have jumped around and done this and i'm sort of like well that is to the to the detriment of my enjoyment of the film if i think that way you know yeah um i think and, and i think so I'm, I'm i think i'm quite a generous disbelief suspender as well you know what a suspender of disbelief right, a yeah. suspender right yeah. okay <laughs> a suspender. Right, okay I like that. Um, but what i'll also say is that i think Shyamalan with the sixth sense really had lightning in a bottle that twist tracks perfectly mm mm-hmm. Like that twist, when you go back and rewatch it, it is such a perfect execution. Yeah. And it's kind of when you're trying to recreate something like that, I think it's just impossible to do it. 
Yeah, I think even I, though Unbreakable was kind of a like a pretty convincing follow up, I think that it's one of those things that where you write an ending like that in your first feature. I think that you've kind of always got a little bit of a kind of second album syndrome that's going to follow you around <laughs> past your second film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of like like I, I wonder if the village would have worked better had we known from the beginning that it was a modern world and these people were isolated. Like I, I wonder about you know some of those sort of choices you know of of needing to add the twist at the end. I'm not sure sure that it would have been better that way but it's it's something to you know that's kind of curious to me you know the village is not it's it's not perfect and there's a lot that when you really start i i read one review i think it was maybe the new york times review of it where you know he basically said if you try to go through this with a fine tooth comb like of logic it's gonna fall apart pretty quickly but there's something about it that to me is still just like kind of captivating and it's such a weird little anomaly of a movie like i mean this movie how, i mean I, I don't know if you guys know what the budget was i i don't off the top of my head though do you know normally that is something I, that was that would normally be something i would have i know mitch is jumping on his phone just now i've got a yeah. vague me- memory of it being somewhere in the region of a hundred million dollars yeah i mean i would because they built that entire village god. yeah yeah <laughs> good like, god they, mitch they, yeah yeah you know, and they have, I mean, you know, William Hurt, Sigourney Weaver, yeah. you know, walking. I mean, these are j- massive stars. And it, it just, it's funny to me to think of this totally weird movie that's about this, like, weird community that's, like, almost like religious extremists in a way. Like, they're, they're, it's a weird little community. And then with this, like, massive twist ending, and it's, it's just, like, it's such a weird movie to spend so much money on and have be a blockbuster. <laughs> like that i i can't help but love it <laughs> um i have it it's uh so the budget was uh does anyone want to have an estimate of what the budget was was i way off base so yeah you were way north with 100 <laughs> Graham, uh you want to take a shot I, what I was, the budget I was, was gonna, on this I, I was gonna think like 20 million okay uh the answer is exactly in between those two the budget was 60 million right okay 60 cool. million wow. so off the back of that anyone want to have a guess of what it grossed worldwide i'm gonna say i'm gonna say like I'm gonna say eighty. Two hundred and fifty-six point seven Holy million fuck. dollars. Woo! Holy shit! <laughs> say what you like about that about the film, but the numbers don't lie. I was gonna say so, like yeah, so like critically, it took a it took a mulling, but commercially, huge. But what I will say, I know Graham, you're saying that certainly when you were when it first came out, a lot of people were really down on it. But I know you've been seeing some of the stuff on the Twitter uh, since we announced that you were coming on the show. A lot of love out there for it. Yeah. Oh, people, yeah, are, people are people that, are lighting up behind you on this one, Graham. Seriously, yeah. that's great. No, I'm I'm glad. You know, and I kind of I kind of wondered if that would happen because I feel like I feel like this is a movie that a lot of people kind of maybe have forgotten about over the last 14 years, but that when they think back on it, they go, "Oh yeah, I really liked that when it came out." You know, I mean, this I mean, you talked about Roger Deakins too. I mean, this movie is so beautiful. Like this movie deserves like a really beautiful Blu-ray release. You know, it's a big film. Which is why it's still so it's so weird, you know, like <laughs> that you have this blind girl running through the forest, you know, and encountering park rangers and <laughs> it's just, like so bonkers and brave. Yeah, I, th- I think that um, there's a th- there's a few instances in there where I think that like the budget and the scale of the production is kind of at odds with the weirdness of the thing. <laughs> yeah, you know what I yeah, mean. But but I but like I respect that. I mean, imagine you know, so you're in my Shyamalan, right? Now, granted, you've had three hits. Up, mm-hmm. You know, so so it's no wonder that he's able to go in and do this. But I mean, at the time, I would imagine he's sort of similar to like a Christopher Nolan. He can kind of go in and he can say, "I want to do this movie." And they'll give him whatever money he wants to do whatever he wants. Yeah, I think I, so I think he, I think a pre airband a pre airbender Shyamalan can make those kinds of demands. I would oh, say that was the film I was expecting. That or the happening. Uh, oh him. yeah, oh yeah. Well, <laughs> the happening. We can talk about the happening. The happen- <laughs> happening is another movie I am fascinated by. <laughs> that, that movie. That movie is so it's it's I, I own that one too. And oh my I, I, god! I, 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 that one is definitely not as good as the village. <laughs> I, I would uh, say. Yeah. I want to I want to start a series of a kind of like a sub series of the show where yeah. just like periodically you just reappear to defend specifically M Night yeah. Shyamalan movies. Skip her on Shyamalan. <laughs> Skip her on Shyamalan exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, what an interesting filmmaker though, you know, because like you start with, I mean, that first run of you know Six Sense and unbreakable and signs you know those are three pretty strong movies absolutely you know? and then he and and then you know you have the village which i think is is it's just sort of fascinating how divisive it is it's it's not as fast-paced as those other movies are you know it's not as 
you know, like the sixth sense is like pretty scary. Uh, There's a lot of totally. It's almost know, a reaction to the stuff that he'd done up to that point. The village, I think, for a lot of the time. It feels it feels a little bit like it. Like it feels like he wanted to make. It feels like he watched Barry Lyndon. Oh, I yeah. was like, I'm gonna <laughs> make a period drama, you know, which I respect out of the guy, you know, and 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 that his imagination is, I think, just so vast that he just comes up with these bonkers ideas, you know, and then he's one of the few artists that's given the the means to actually execute them. And I, I think that of the of his big ideas, I think that this is the one that that is the, the most strong um, of them. One thing that I think the village has over the sixth sense is that when you watch the sixth sense again after knowing the twist, the sixth sense is still essentially the same movie. You just know the secret. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. For me, the village, the first time you watch it, this is a monster movie, right? Mm-hmm. And 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 this is a movie about about creatures that are coming in to get these innocent people uh, with the twist at the end. When you watch it again, it becomes more of a romantic drama with this weird, insidious conservatism undertone to it that I think I, I, I think that in this case, knowing the twist adds a layer to it that in his other sort of twist endings they don't you know like with you know unbreakable it doesn't really matter if you know that he's a superhero you know the whole time <laughs> like it's still kind of the same experience watching yeah but it plays like basically the same way doesn't it doesn't yeah you know same with signs you know it's like well you know how to kill them now but you, you know you're still watching this sort of thriller about these aliens but the village just to me I, I think that he put in a lot of layers to it and whether or not they all totally track perfectly you know i'm not sure that that's the case but i think that he <laughs> I, I i what i find really interesting about it is that the twist and the world that he built around this feels bigger than what we actually see and i love that in the fantasy film of thinking about you know, all these characters have a previous existence and they all have their own sort of hopes and dreams. And his other films are very sort of focused. And this one feels a lot more like an ensemble piece to me. Mm-hmm. And there's something that's just sort of captivating about that to me. Hmm. I just want to talk about, because uh, that is quite a gloomy film. One part that I particularly liked is when uh, Judy Greer is really pushing uh, her relationship onto William Hurt, uh, or her desire to marry Joaquin Phoenix. Uh-huh. And, uh, she's uh, basically asking William Hurt's permission to marry. He says something to her along the lines of, don't tell anyone about your burstings, which I <laughs> yeah. thought was quite funny. And then she goes and declares a love to, again, a very stony-faced Joaquin Phoenix. Which is a gutsy move. Yeah, it's a pretty it's- <laughs> She goes in pretty bold. She goes in hot. It's um, it's yeah. it's also, but like you say, it's it's a it's a pretty funny scene just because of the way that she's so <laughs> impassioned and he's so stoic. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then it cuts to perfect comedy timing. Her crying, screaming, and wailing I in a bed. It. That got a proper I laugh out of me on this watch. Yeah, I, got, I I laughed as well. Totally forgot about it. And uh, yeah, it was effective. And when I look back on it, I'm glad there's little bits like that in there because it is quite po faced. It is quite serious. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it needs it needs that levity, and I agree. I mean, that moment uh, that moment I got a laugh out of me too. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's so it's so funny. I you know I'm glad you actually brought up that little conversation she has with William Hurt because I find it really funny to think about how everybody talks oh. in the village. There's some some <laughs> like, some, some, of, some of the of the, of the I think a lot of the a lot of the period detail and stuff and it's pretty convincing. I think that the, the things in it that threaten to yank me out of it the most are kind of individual dialogue moments. So I'd be interested to know what your dig is on that. Well, yeah, it's it's just uh, so this time I was going okay. You know, these people chose to tell themselves and to tell their descendants we are living in the 1800s because I was thinking about about sort of the logic of this, right? You know, let let's say that. Bryce Dallas Howard and, Mo- and Joaquin Phoenix. Let's say I think she was like seventeen when she shot this. Wow! And Could I can be. imagine that Joaquin yep. was maybe like twenty, maybe twenty-five. So I was going, okay. So if this is two thousand four, then they must have made the choice back in like the early eighties to to start this commune mm-hmm. because none of the children know, right? It's only the elders. That yeah, know. it's only the elders that try to. So I was like, okay, so they've been there for, let's say, 25 years. Because you see in that picture, like, Sigourney Weaver's holding a baby Joaquin. Yeah. And then another another woman's pregnant, you know? So, I'm like, okay, let's say it's 25 years. It was striking to me that they could have moved to a field somewhere and built houses with electricity. And yeah. built, you know, things with modern trappings. And just told them, yeah, there are 
aliens and ghosts out in those woods. Don't go there. Yeah. But instead they chose to adopt a lifestyle that was, you know, more like Amish, you know, like an 1800 style thing. And on top of that, they chose to talk like people in the 1800s. That, yeah, yeah which I, I think is an interesting choice. I find it, ja- I find it a little bit, biz- I find bizarre. I feel like it's simply a device to sell his twist. I, I, I think that you, you may be right about that. I, I, I tried to sort of justify it to myself. And what I <laughs> came up with, is, what I kind of came up with is, is that, you know, these are people that have decided to play act for the rest of their lives. Sure. And yeah. I think that they... I read an interview with Shyamalan where he was talking about how to him the 1800s are like a truly innocent time. And he talked a little bit about the language in the script. And his take on it was that people back then spoke more freely and more directly. That because there was such a sort of like rigid, like societal, you know, expectation, uh, there, there weren't, you know, so many like platitudes, you know, it was more direct. Yeah. Um, and so I in, in my sort of reality of the movie, I went, well, I guess it would make sense. You know, if they're like, look, we're going to change this lifestyle. We're going to live on this commune. We're going to create this whole world. But they're doing it because they legitimately want to have an innocent culture that they might then adopt an innocent way of speaking to what to them is an innocent way of speaking okay. of something from a, a, a simpler time. That you know, because they're hoping it's all gonna start over, and perhaps know? that's why it's a little bit uh, inconsistent at times. <laughs> well, is that they haven't quite nailed it. I was just thinking that because, like, because yeah. there's because, uh, <laughs> like I say, like, just like I said a minute ago, there, like some of the things that the individual moments that kind of threaten to take me out of the kind of period drama element of it are kind of some individually what I think are kind of ropey dialogue moments. But you can almost make the argument that it's basically kind of canon, that that it's not going to be perfect because they've made this conscious decision to revert to the language of the 1800s. I guess you can only, but, go, you can only go on what you've read in books. And like, exactly. <laughs> so like, so, so maybe maybe them not getting it dead on all the time kind of tracks. I mean, like, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. You I know, mean, it, it feels it, like it, a stretch, yeah, but it's a possibility, you know? It, it, does, it does feel like a stretch, and that's what's... That's what's hard about this movie is that, like, I, I know this movie has a lot of problems, and I know that if you do really kind of try to pick it apart, things kind of start to fall apart a little bit. But I, I do think that, you know, Shyamalan, that every choice that Shyamalan made in this, whether or not he executed it perfectly, that he had, like, a, a really solid intention behind it. Yeah, I think that um, whether or not things necessarily work or don't work, I don't think that anything in there is there by accident. No, I don't. I don't think he's that kind of person. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think that he. I think he's. My understanding is he spent quite a lot of time preparing this movie. And now, granted, he was at that point in his career where I'm sure nobody was telling him no, you know, or nobody was offering him criticism. Oh, absolutely. He yeah. could have made whatever he wanted at this point, and I feel like he, I think he did. did. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he totally did. Um, I, there's a yeah. part. There's a dialogue, but that, that I like that's very of the time and of the dialogue in the film. And it's when um, Bryce Dallas Howard's kind of, uh, she's got a very formal way of coming on to Joaquin Phoenix when she says, uh, I'm now free to receive interest from anyone who may have interest. And she kind of waggles her blind eyebrows at him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, that's hot. That, is, that scene's hot. Yeah, yeah that's, a good, that's a good scene. That's a good scene. I like, yeah, I like that. And I like, uh, there's the later one, I guess, where they're like sitting on the porch at night. Oh yeah, I find dancing yeah. agreeable. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I like. That. I think that's so effective. You know, I think it's sweet, and I think it it uh that's another great misdirect by Shyamalan because we're really now getting invested in these two as this you know budding couple. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, like like even at the beginning, you kind of think that maybe the the conflict is going to be between her and her sister because she's sort of stealing the guy that her sister liked. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. yeah. Oh, or, that would have been interesting. You even wonder like, is there something wrong with with what is Joaquin's character? Lucius? Is Lucius. That yeah, Lucius, that's Lucius. Right. Yeah, yeah. I remember also kind of wondering, oh, is there something wrong with Lucius? You know, he's this really quiet guy and like he keeps going out into the woods. You know, what's up with him? Yeah, um, fair. You know, so so I think I think it's just sort of interesting. What I will say, too, is, is what I find funny here is that, you know, we are not talking at all about the monsters. No, knowing, not yet, no. You know, knowing True. that they're not real, you know, like I sort of said before, the story shifts so much into this like character drama. That we forget that, like when you first see this movie, man, this is a this is a monster movie, and I'm sort of fascinated by the mythology that he that the the elders have created. And and what I'm curious to ask you guys is why do you think they do the all the thing with the red? The color red is the forbidden color, 
and the color yellow is safe. Shyamalan's very open about the fact that he uses red to denote danger, um, and he has done even since the Sixth Sense. So I think that's something yeah. that he's he's kind of carrying on through it. And uh, yellow is traditionally a kind of neutral color. Um, so I think that's probably the science behind it. I, don't, I would. I think that uh, I'm gonna go another way <laughs> with uh, <laughs> the fact that. I think that the one of the reasons why I think that they go for, like you say, you know, they could have set up any community and set in any time. Mm-hmm. And I think that they're going after a certain kind of like moral purity. So there could be like a scarlet letter kind of thing in there as well. The choice of the red kind of thing, you know? It's another thing I was considering. Yeah, Just kind of like, you know, because obviously they're kind of trying to kind of cultivate a moral backbone as well. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, I, I found myself wondering about that. And mm-hmm. I, the only thing that I could kind of think, if I was thinking practically about it, I wonder if, you know, they know that the only places those red berries grow is out in the forest. And oh, yeah. They tell people the color red's awful, don't go near red. And they know that in the forest is red, then maybe it's an extra sort of deterrent of don't go that way. Okay, yeah, that follows as well. Um, Funny, you know, it, it was uh, something that I didn't actually really, it was one of the things I accepted a lot easier in the film as being part of it the red and yellow thing okay I didn't really question it when I was watching it at all um, aside from the fact that I knew that about M. Night Shyamalan that he, he always uses red to denote impending danger okay I yeah I didn't really I didn't really consider it or, or really think really question his reasoning it's, for it's, yeah no I, and I didn't really either it just sort of you know struck me I was like I wonder what I wonder why you know what tracks about this but, but I agree I think that visually mm-hmm. and like tonally it works completely and it's quite you know, striking maybe that's something that i mean maybe that's something you know interesting about Shyamalan too is that he, how do i put this he <laughs> makes movies that you know are movies yeah you know what i mean it's entirely possible that he was like red is danger for me so it's red and yellow and you don't need to worry about the logic behind why the elders would have chosen the color red yeah. mm-hmm. you know and and to the same degree i think that he's kind of unconcerned with the nitty gritty details about like why are they sending blind ivy through the woods <laughs> you know why wouldn't they choose a more able person you know how how did they keep this a secret for so long you know you're not i think he's kind of unconcerned with those logic questions because again this is such a fable that he's telling yeah. mm-hmm. that like when you're hearing about the tortoise and the hare you're not going, well, why, you know, why didn't the hare just, you know, finish the race first and then come back and talk to the tortoise to mock it? You know? <laughs> that's, that's not the point, you know? Like, here's, here's our dicks. <laughs> right. You know, so so I, I think he's kind of unconcerned with that because he's sort of, he's, he's telling us, it's a pretty simple story narratively, but I think yeah. the characters are pretty complex. Okay. And I think maybe that's something that to me is interesting about the film. Does Bryce Dallas Howard also have super hearing? Well, she is she is blind, and, yeah, and I know they that. I know they do say that uh, heightened, your, your, your heightened senses, senses are heightened, but she seems to be able to hear people from a distance in peril when they're at the wedding. Yeah, yeah, is I'm that allowed. sorry? I, don't know. <laughs> I, I I choose to, I choose to believe she has daredevil powers, and so she also knows. Oh her. yeah, well she's pretty handy with that stick later on. Maybe, <laughs> she she is yeah, yeah she puts up a good fight. Yeah, absolutely. If she has superhero powers, you could argue that this is set in the same universe as Unbreakable. Oh, oh my God, can you imagine? The, great, the M. Night Shyamalan. The Shyamalaniverse. The Shyamalaniverse. Oh, my God. Me. What are we doing here? Um, <laughs> what were the magic rocks all about? Oh, yeah. What like, was that? This was, something that? this was something that got away from me as well, actually. Yeah, it was just like when she sets off. She said something about magic rocks. To... Well, because the didn't her father give he gives her the magic rocks. He's like these will protect you. <laughs> right. Okay, okay. He is just spinning the biggest web of shit. <laughs> he is. <laughs> He's he just is. like making it... things up on the spot to try to keep his lie going. Well, and, and what's interesting though is when you think about that, he knows at least he he believes that there are no monsters out in the woods, mm-hmm. right? So he's giving her these rocks because he knows she's going to be scared, and he doesn't want her to be scared. So he's going to give her something, some talisman, because you know she's still living in a world of magic that she can you know so like a basically like a stress ball something that that she can have you know that will comfort her um mm-hmm. as she's going and keep her brave enough to continue on yeah we kind of pl- placate her and yeah and like the two people that are protecting her although they ditch her in record time <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but, but yeah but like uh, yeah, yeah exactly that um but Mitch, that was a point you nearly checked out uh the magic rocks thing was a stretch for me yeah but uh, but <laughs> no we hear what you're saying though graham i have a question for you though because at this point like you've like, obviously at this point in your career you've written and directed if you were to remake this now what would you change oh interesting 
Gosh, that's a really interesting question. I apart from apart from possibly would... making it a ten part Netflix series, so you could flesh out all the subplots <laughs> in the village. <laughs> right. exactly. If you were remaking that as a feature, what would you change? You know, probably what I do is instead of I think one of the muddier aspects of this is, and and one of the things that's not explored enough is the idea of the elders like dressing up in these suits to go and scare the townspeople. Yeah. Um, okay. And I I was always really interested in the idea of how far would they go to keep up the ruse. Right. So like, what if, you know, let's see, Jesse Eisenberg kept testing it and he kept going out further and further and further. And he was really risking, you know, that they, they, they thought, man, he's going to come upon that wall. He's going to discover it. That's okay. kind of similar. Yeah, 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 I've, yeah. Got a note, I've got a note written down here, which is kind of kind of playing into the, I guess, the twist ending and how obviously we're supposed to believe there's never been any kind of noise pollution or light pollution or there's never been like kids fucking in the trees. Like there's never been kids like exploring. Like what if some kid from the outside came wandering in? Like sure. Then sure. did they kill that yeah, kid? What do they do? Did they kill that kid? Did they ingratiate that kid into the the community? I mean, I think that that's the most interesting choice, right? It's like how <laughs> how far are you willing to go to, to perpetuate your lie? Yeah, ruse. Yeah. And I mean, that's ultimately yeah. what that's ultimately what what we land on at the end isn't it really i mean like when um when she comes back and it dawns on adrian brody and noah's parents that he must have died and then after she leaves they have this or after she leaves they have the conversation basically where no they hear that she's encountered a monster and she's killed it yeah and they know immediately because the the costume's missing that it's their son that has died and then basically yeah it's at that point that it's william hurt right who confronts them all and says basically this is a terrible thing that's happened but now that he's dead basically we have this window to perpetuate this lie for generations to come kind of thing yeah but but then you think you go hmm but what happens when somebody else gets sick you know what happens at the next crime yeah and i think you know and when everybody goes well we can just go to the next town and get you know and get medicine like ivy says they're nice that i i think that we begin to see you know the the kinks in the armor yeah and, yeah, I think that's fair. You know, and again, it's sort of like, like I think Brendan Gleeson is kind of resigned to it. He's he sort of at the end says, "Well, you know, if it's over, it's over." And, and but we we tried our best. And you to know, me, this it, feels it, this feels very much like the beginning of the end for them. It's never going to be the same from this point on. It's always going to be a battle from here to keep it secret. And yeah, with the yeah, best, I, wh- I agree. And, yeah, and 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 I think that begs the question. Yeah, like how far do you go? Yeah, you know, and who is really dedicated to the cause, and what is the cause about e- anymore? You know, if it's about like for me, I, I kept going and, you know, that it's why it's interesting. That's about the remake question. Like I kept going, gosh, you know, this is all about preserving mm-hmm. innocence. So what is the moral dilemma when to preserve the innocence, you have to kill somebody? Oh. You know, that to me is a really interesting aspect of it, which I think speaks to Shyamalan's kind of world building. Graham, I'm I'm still in all in all truth. We're coming at the end of this. I'm not sure what i make of this film but i think that <laughs> what i what i think is interesting and what i think you've hit on i think that's mo- this most interesting from this is that i think that the missed opportunity in storytelling here was to present it as being kind of like letting the audience in on the secret from the off rather than making it a twist i think it kind of introducing the fact that it was a ruse and that was established from the beginning and what you saw instead was this kind of this how far would you go kind of thing would possibly have made for for me a more interesting film yeah yeah i i, I would agree with you i think i think that's possible and and i think that uh you know again we kind of talked about Shyamalan being hamstrung by needing to have a twist and everything i think you're right you know i i think that there's a lot of different like maybe the thing about this movie that that people feel lukewarm about is just that is that there are ideas behind it are so captivating and the world is so sort of interesting and the motivations of the characters are so like fascinating and alien that you you can't help but go oh i i wish i knew more about this aspect of it mm-hmm. or i wish i knew more about this um and instead he kind of he, he like he does in all of his movies he really streamlines the story yeah like i think i think i think if this movie were made today for you said like what 60 million something like that that if the movie were made today i think it would be big and bloated like two and a half hours long yeah you know and i I kind of appreciate that he you know like shamla makes pulp movies basically you know he makes these like high concept pulp movies with huge budgets and so i think it's you know it's just sort of interesting that like there's a lot you know we've got a lot to talk about with this movie and it's all stuff that we're like oh i wish i wish he told us more about this or even down to the point like you said of I wish that we had known the twist from the outset because that would have informed all the decisions that the characters were making from the beginning. And it just adds that layer of 
it's like a layer of tension yeah you know yeah. to the whole thing Andy, what's your take or like at the back Whoa. end of this now? So um, I've actually just before we, before I got onto that, I just remembered something else that really tickled me. There's a bit where Bryce Dallas Howard's in her house and she goes into the wardrobe to hang up her a, a, a cloak, I suppose. Yeah. And and, <laughs> and Adrian Brody's hiding in there, pissing himself, laughing. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's just like so in weird. there laughing, which I guess kind of shows he is a bit. Yeah, there's something going on there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's I, I remember that too. That was really it's really weird and creepy. <laughs> but he's obviously he's obviously having the best time, like as an actor and as a character at that point. Uh oh yeah. But uh um, as she was notwithstanding, I don't mind the film. I didn't mind it the first time. I didn't mind it again when I rewatched it. I still can't quite resign myself to the the decision to go down the puritanical road and take on and adopt the language. Although Graham, you've made a pretty compelling case for that. I mean, I just keep thinking, imagine they'd done that in Braveheart. <laughs> like, or, or like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, where they're pretty much doing the same thing, but they're actually speaking in modern voices. It's, I don't know, it just, I found that jarring. I like the twist, but I, I, again, I can't, re- I find it difficult to drag myself away from the logistical, the science of it. If you I, think. I like the twist better than I remembered liking it. I also like the twist better than I remembered it. Yeah. Uh, again, but again, this is this is having like let's say I saw it when I was eighteen, nineteen, and yeah, I think that at the time I was like, oh, no, I don't know, kind of flat. And I think watching it back, weirdly knowing the twist, I kind of like when it got to a point narratively where I was looking forward to the twist. Yeah, I much prefer it as the the drama love story side of it. I feel that that's where the film's at its absolute it's, strongest. It does its best work. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I yeah. agree. I yeah. agree. It's in those tender moments with Joaquin Phoenix and Bryce Dallas Howard on a step. Um, it's in the goofy moments where um, Judy Greer talks to her dad. It's in those little moments, I think, where the film's at its strongest. Where it falls down is where it pushes too hard to get us to that twist. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I, I think that I think the real strength of this movie and what a lot of people don't really think about when they think about this movie is that at its heart, it is a, a love story and it's a character drama. Um, and it's also a, a really strong, I think, ensemble piece in terms of the acting. You know, every all these actors are great. They're all, I think, firing on all cylinders. You know, even Adrian Brody, who does, you know, risk a little bit going to the Tropic Thunder route, <laughs> is, is that, that I, I think he... It's a really, really hard tightrope to walk as an actor, and I yeah. think he walks it really well. And you know, you feel for him, and especially that that moment at the end where he has, you know, Lucius's blood on his hands, and he's saying "bad color," you know, and he's sort of laughing oh, and then he's fuck. crying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, sure. It's you know that to me, you know, I think it's just it's heartbreaking, and and it's again that's such a hard moment to nail as an actor, and I think Adrian Brody is one of the few that's really up to that challenge. That scene is. Excellent. The the stabbing scene. The st- actually, oh, I, I, want, I wanted to mention that. Actually, yeah, the, the the scene where the stabbing happens is so well done. It hits like a punch in the gut to me when you like, or a hut like a punch. Or a in the knife gut to, to the the knife to the gut, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. No, I thought it was really well done. I'd actually kind of forgotten that that was how they did it. No, it's it's a really like dramatically satisfying and kind of shocking moment. I think. Yeah. It's there. There's a lot. There's a lot in this movie, and and I think that you know, un- unfortunately, there are a lot of logistical questions that immediately <laughs> pop up as soon as the twist presents itself. You know, but I I think that even even once you kind of accept the twist. You know, if you're able to kind of look past some of the logistical, you know, uh, muddy points that I think that even then the twist still informs more layers about who these people are and why they did what they did. And the implications of, you know, even the very first shot of it, of this little this little boy is dead and what could they have done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's just I I think it's I think it's a fascinating movie Um, and it's it's not Shyamalan's best. Um, oh, that's the happening. You know, but I, <laughs> that's the happening. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's not his best, but but I also don't think that it's like the pile of hot garbage that people often say it is. Can I make it um, out to be? Yeah. No, no, yeah. no. Um, the, the happening is a pile of hot garbage. The happening is the happening love, is bad. Actually, man. I love the opening scene of the happening with all the you know the lady with the what is it the knitting needle that she puts in her eye or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> So I cool. do, I do like that. I thought, I thought that was a good creepy moment. Um, good, just, just out of curiosity. Um, what has your take been on kind of recent Shyamalan? Let's say, like, say, like the visit and Split and things like that. What, what? Um, have I, you... I really like the visit and Split. I um, Agreed. I liked the visit a lot. I love Split. I thought Split was great, and again, I think that so much of that movie falls on McAvoy's shoulders. Mm-hmm. You know, of being able to sell that. 
And I think he sells it really, really well. And I think that him adding that tag and putting it in the in the Unbreakable universe, that to me was like Shyamalan at his peak, man. That was him <laughs> going, I am going to hit you with something so bonkers and weird that, you know, you'll never see it coming. And we didn't see it coming at all, but no, it, it got us excited. You yeah, know? That, I did not um, see the end in a split coming. No. that I was all in for the end in a split. I thought that... <laughs> When he's uh, just like covered in veins and just fucking oh un- yeah uh, yeah I was totally on board for the end of Split. I like the yeah. ending of Split. I'm kind of of the opinion that it's a- approximately three quarters of a great film. I am not mad on the last half hour or so, but I like I like where it ends up. But I think the route to it um kind of bothers me a little bit. But uh, I think that it's a good it's a good. I, th- I see what you mean about it being kind of like peak Shyamalan. <laughs> If nothing else, yeah, it just it just felt like he was really getting back to you know kind of what we loved about his yeah. like thriller sensibility, sure. you know, at the beginning of his career. It, you know, I think like with um, you know, like The Last Airbender and like Lady <laughs> in the Water, you know, I think those movies are 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 technically pretty interesting. And I think like The Last Airbender is kind of a weird thing, you know, it's sort of its own like animal. But like I think with Lady in the Water, again, he's you know here's Shyamalan really going wild with his ideas. Um, I just think that it doesn't it doesn't really come together as well as the other ones do. I, agree. I think that the I you know I think the visit I really liked the visit. I, I was I was sort of amazed that somebody was able to bring back a found footage movie that affected me in the same way as like early found footage films did. Yeah, you know, like okay. using that toolbox to to really go like full horror. I thought was great. And then yeah, then I I thought Split. I just I, I liked it. You know, it was really fun and. You know, again, I, 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 and I think maybe because we've had so much time since The Sixth Sense that I wasn't looking for a twist. So I was just kind of along for the ride on this movie. And what I loved is that there wasn't so much a twist within, like, the main narrative of the film. You know, the twist was a coda. It was a fun Easter egg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which, which I liked because, you know, we weren't, then we weren't relying on the whole movie you know, the whole movie didn't then have to stand on, you know, this one big final twist at the end, which I think is what is one of the negative things about The Village is that the the twist, while I like it and I think it adds stuff to the movie with The Sixth Sense, like you, you know, the, the whole movie can stand on that twist yeah. and it works perfectly. And he goes back and shows you this is how I tricked you. <laughs> and with The Village, you know, and with The Village he gives us this twist which i think which which i think works personally but then when you try to put you know the movie then on top of that twist that that is where the logic questions start coming in and i and i think that audiences are inevitably going to do that whether or not Shyamalan was concerned about that you know he i I, and i don't think he was i don't feel like he was no no no, (laughs) definitely not i just don't think he i don't think he cared you know it's like i went to the the story because i want to tell it but yeah so, so i think like the split that's what i really liked about it was you didn't really need a, a twist, you know, and, and we weren't looking for it. We weren't really expecting it. We were just kind of um, excited to be freaked out by James McAvoy. <laughs> and the, yeah, and the, and the twist that you get, it's a gutsy move. It is, it's, a, it's a pretty ambitious one, I think. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah, it's great. But again, it's great. It's like, it, it's, it feels so much like Shyamalan at his peak going, fuck it, man, I'm going to do this. <laughs> if nothing else, man, he's a director that gets people talking because a lot of people fucking hate him and a lot of people love him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and every film, pretty much every film he's ever made, has its naysayers and the people who are one hundred percent behind it. Yeah, he's a he's a really interesting. It's it's a really interesting filmography. What can I say? His movies are never boring. Definitely not. Whatever no. else they are, yeah. Um, and I think this it was a good it was a good call. It was a good selection to bring to the table as well because there's quite a lot to unpack in there. <laughs> I would say. Um, Thanks, yeah. Uh, Very much so. Graham, before we wrap this up, I do want to take a minute to talk about um, uh, Sequence Break. Yeah, um, um, yeah. Out now out now in the UK. You can go get it on DVD and see it on Shutter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, so it's out through Matchbox in the UK and physical, right? Uh, yes. Yep, yeah. It's yep. through Matchbox on physical, you know, so I think it's in HMV and all the... All it sure, yes, it sure is. And um, uh, um, just uh, just for the benefit of anyone who might not know the full deal with Sequence Break, uh, you want to fill in, fill them, fill them in. This isn't on the clock. It's not on the clock. No, take this your time. <laughs> no, not on the clock. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sequence Break. Um, I mean, the the simplest way that I can describe it is it's a a, a story about a man Oz uh, who's a video arcade repair technician played by Chase Williamson, um, who uh sort of has a crisis moment in his life where he finds out that the arcade repair shop that he works at is closing, 
he meets a girl that he connects with on a romantic level for the first time ever, and a mysterious new arcade game appears in his shop. Um, and when he plays this arcade game, it appears to cause hallucinations and and cause him to to cause his reality to start to warp. And so as his life sort of crumbles around him, the game takes a stronger and stronger hold, and ultimately he uh, has to go down the trippy fleshy slimy cronenbergian rabbit hole um uh, in speaking my language side and 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 uh figure out uh uh you know uh, figure out this mystery that's now entered his life and how he's going to uh co- you know come out of it alive but yeah it's a it's a cronenberg i, I also i call it a, a cronenbergian love triangle between a man a woman and a sentient video arcade machine <laughs> <laughs> And if that's not a sell, I don't know what is. I really enjoyed Sequence Break. I'm looking forward to checking it out again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I really, uh, you know, it's a bonkers movie and <laughs> it has some big ideas in it and lots of slimy, goopy arcade sex. So, you know, <laughs> what what more could people want? There you go. That's, home? yeah, exactly. very much so. Graham, thanks so much for taking the time to come and talk uh, both The Village and Sequence Break with us tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I had a total blast and uh, yeah, I, 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 I am often a defender of Milan film so i'd love to come back anytime and, and talk other bad movies oh, that, with you guys that would be amazing yeah yeah welcome back anytime uh where can people get you people where can people catch up with you social media wise and so on you want to do that um yeah on you find me on twitter at graham skipper graham like graham cracker skipper like gilligan's island uh, <laughs> is and that's mostly where i'm at i'm on instagram uh at skipstagram right yeah <laughs> um, yeah um yep. yeah and then and then on my website is grahamskipper.com and news and stuff there and come say hi graham thanks a lot and uh, yeah don't forget everybody uh, Sequence Break out now uh, streaming exclusively on Shudder and physical release in the UK on Matchbox yeah, I, I checked it out on Shudder oh, loved yeah. it thanks you're welcome <laughs> Graham thanks a lot so Sequence Break director Graham Skipper there stopping in yeah. and uh, I would say not necessarily converting me on The Village I'm still very much on the fence about that film but I think kind of broadening my reading of it a little bit yeah me too uh, every wise ass fucking comment I had uh, put before him uh, he had an answer for it so uh, yeah he had a same- yeah he I-, I feel schooled in a way oh very much so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, like a, a really good discussion. And, yeah, uh, very much so, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and do check out uh, not just Sequence Break, Graham's film that's out on the directed that's on Shutter. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But also just like, yeah, I mean, he's been in a lot of great features over the last couple of years. I have a particular affection myself for Beyond the Gates. Jackson yeah. Stewart's film, have you seen that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've of course, got it. Of course you have. Of course yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. Great film, great film. But turning our attentions back to this week's mailbag. Oh, wait. <laughs> the, the what? The mailbag. We're calling it the mailbag. I don't like, think we're that... on fucking going live. Yeah, it's good. So like, we're going gonna to make, like, gonna make like 1994. <laughs> we're going to start getting uh, little uh, photos of the, the tweets up and stuff like that with that little tune from Heartbeat, from Tony Hart's Heartbeat <laughs> playing over it as we go over the tweets of the week. I just like the, the idea. The mailbag. I like creating the idea that's like, you know, the, the creating the mental picture of someone coming in emptying a bag of letters on the table like in Miracle on 34th Street. We've got expensive equipment on these tables. I don't want stuff pulled all over it. That's true. The it's mailbag, fun. you've lost your fucking mind. Right, fuck the mailbag. Let's go with the feedback section. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> right, quite a lot of stuff this week again. Christ, I know. Um, so, so thanks very much to everyone that's been getting in touch. Um, as always, I will have a w- quick recap of the various ways you can do that once we're done here. Relic of the detention argument. Oh, Kate, uh, Caitlin Downs uh-huh. gets in touch. That's Hello, at, Caitlin. That's at Caitlin M. Downs on Twitter. Says, um, fair point here. She said uh, that we uh, missed the mention of the fact that Joseph Kahn directed the George Michael video for Freak 04 in the lineup of his music videos, which inherently makes her more inclined to trust him, which I think is reasonable. Do I, even, do I know that song? Oh, YouTube it. Sing it? No. <laughs> Damn it. But you see it. Uh, <laughs> so it. That, that's the the first and only contribution about detention this week, which I think conclusively Good. proves that I am correct. But carry on. I feel like it's slowly moving out of memory, moving into the murky past <laughs> and moving out of memory. Uh, I've got a tweet again uh, regarding Blair Witch 2 uh, from last week when we had Mitch with us, oh, Mitch yeah, Wilson. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, Mad Science Films again. Uh, oh, good man. Yeah, uh, he, he tweeted... Uh, and I want you to prepare yourself for this, Mitch. Okay. Uh, I know you're a sensitive soul. You bastards! Oh my. I've just bought Blair Witch 2. My wallet needs a break from podcast land. James, we've spoken about this before. People that are taking the time to actually go and buy the films for these things, I really think that that is class. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's over and above the Call of Duty. I am... We're doing a service here to... F- 
I guess the filmmakers. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> I, like, yeah, I hope so. Um, we had um, did James got in touch about um the selection for this week as well, didn't he? Or not so much? <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, I, I don't know if you, if anyone heard the the mini sode there. I hope you did. If not, just pop back and have a wee listen. But uh, James got in touch again to say uh, basically when I when we announced that uh, we were going to be doing uh, the village this week, I said that it wasn't the Shyamalan film that I expected it to be. I expected it to be either The Happening mm-hmm. or The Misguided The Last Airbender to which James messaged saying you leave The Last Airbender alone I like the dramatic voice that you're intoning these in yeah I'm going to do a different voice for everyone yeah I'm feeling it it's good um, now <laughs> I'm sure that that's got to be a joke because The Last Airbender's appalling I'm not going to lie I have not seen The Last Airbender uh, it's on, I think it's on Netflix if you want to destroy your day watch The Last Airbender I might, I might get um, around to it you never know you won't um, you know what I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna. But um, uh, we did. We had um, we had a couple from uh, long time friend. Can we have long time friends of the show after seven episodes? I don't think so yet. Uh, friend of the show, Darren regular. G- <laughs> yeah, Darren Gaskell <laughs> at da- at Darren underscore Gaskell uh, got in touch. Got always love Darren's week. messages. He always catches me off guard. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, we had just before we announced that Graham was coming on uh-huh. with um, I was gonna say with Blair Witch Two. Wrong. When he was coming on with the village, uh, you More did. Or less same thing we did we did so yeah they're pretty much interchangeable uh we, d- we did invite people to guess as we often do uh what was going to be coming next and uh darren said i'm probably going to keep guessing surf nazis must die beyond that i got nothing i think we should find out when darren's birthday is and do surf nazis must die just yeah <laughs> just, just do a special then. episode of surf, Na- of surf nazis must die uh, so he listened to uh, Darren listened to the uh, last week's episode on Blair Witch 2 and uh, said we'll have to give Blair Witch 2 a second viewing after listening to this gutsy move listening to it without having pre-watched I think um, and then said uh, check out Strong Violent PC for another quality podcast about another divisive film thank you very much thanks Darren isn't that nice yeah. so I uh, just uh, I had also previously uh, put out a tweet saying uh, if anyone's got any suggestions for films oh yeah uh, that we could do oh we had um, some by, good ones last time yeah by, we've had an addition to that oh yeah uh, I said by all means send over your suggestions um, it's always nice to know the kind of flavour of the things that people want us to do um, although that's not our decision that lies firmly in the hands of our guests Very true. but it's yeah, still yeah. nice to know the kind of flavour of the thing that people want to hear now we had at Moongags Ricky Moonga oh yes uh, Ricky okay get in touch via Twitter to suggest that we do uh, well actually I'll just read the tweet in full because it's nice and short and to the point my suggestion is Big Tits Zombie that's it alright that's the film oh Big Tits Zombie right I see now uh, it comes with an interesting it comes with a front cover here which is uh, three scantily clad Japanese ladies I'm, I'm, I'm assuming they're Japanese uh, that's perhaps profiling on perhaps, my part perhaps um, but I'm assuming they're Japanese um, they're scantily clad one is a samurai sword another is wielding a chainsaw and yet another wielding some sort of battle axe okay emblazoned with the tagline the boobs to die for. Wow. So if you want to know uh, what I'm talking about there, just Google uh, Big Tits Zombie front cover. There you go. Um, I have to say, I haven't seen Big Tits Zombie. <laughs> I, can't, I uh, also have not, I must say. I, I'm incredibly curious. <laughs> it's been, you could say that. Uh, Ricky, thanks very much for getting in touch, man. Yeah, um, uh, what you got next? Okay, so we've got at Molly Soros. That's Jennifer Cooper of okay. uh, Jennifer's Bodies Women in Horror Film Festival. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, she does good work. Yeah, getting in touch just to say, uh, I am 110% with the defence of the village. More people just falling in line behind Graham on this one. Can't get 110%, so she's not to be completely trusted. Um, okay. So, but that's okay. I'm 110 percent with the defence of the village. This is going to be a quality discussion. Oh, I hope you thought so. And then uh, emoji of a wee geek face. Ah, lovely. Yeah. On a slightly less positive note, uh, the Slum Gullion at the Slum Gullion on Twitter quoted the tweet where we announced it and simply asked, "Why, Graham? Why?" <laughs> I hope that I hope that question's been sufficiently answered at this point. But um, or perhaps not. Perhaps, perhaps not. Let us know. To, was it in capital letters? Uh, no, it was actually. Um, it was a uh, very uh, like uh, grammatically proficient. Why, comma Graham? Question mark. Why? Question mark. I'm hoping it comes back through the exact same message, but all in caps. Escalating. Yeah, just like you escalating just, like, in intensity now. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's next? You got anything? No. Was oh, that your lot? 
I think I'm cleaned out. Okay, in that case, I've got um, a couple of things. Fucking hell. We had uh, Steve Hugh Nelson, at Steve Hugh Nelson, get in touch on Twitter. Again, um, major uh, The Village fan, saying, uh, beautiful, cinematog- beautiful cinematography and emotional score, a meaningful twist. The Village is M. Night's masterpiece. <laughs> uh, Fuck off. A little bit of a stretch, maybe, but, you know, I would say I'm coming out. Uh, we'll see. Uh, general audiences were just upset because the marketing sold them signs too instead of a tense period romance. Looking forward to the episode. And again, I think Stephen's touching on a couple of things that Graham touched on there. I would say, yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. yeah. I have found something else. Okay, just, um, but yeah, but uh, Stephen's up with Steve Hugh Nelson on Twitter. Thanks for getting in touch there. Thanks, Stephen. Sticking with Stevens. Oh, yeah. Uh, we have a Stephen Keith on Keith Facebook um, who tagged us in to say his day off started by watching this potentially ridiculous film, Mitch and Andy are to blame. And the film in question, Raw Head Rex. Oh, I've still so, got a soft spot for that episode. Yeah, that was a good. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed it, Stephen. <laughs> How could you not? How could you not? I know you better yeah. get something out of that one. You know, I have a couple actually. All of this, pretty much, apart from that last one there from uh, Stephen, was uh, Twitter. A couple more on Facebook. Again, just tying into the announcement of the village. Right. So uh, we had uh, Ali Wilkes uh, get in touch and say, definitely giving this one a listen, as I think The Village is an underrated horror gem. Fight me! I just uh, did the intonation for when she switched to capital letters there. Right, okay. So, uh, yeah. Was that Ali female? Uh, yes. Oh, right, okay. So she, uh, yeah. I did threaten to fight then, so uh, apologies. Oh, I think uh, it was a very non-threatening gift, though. <laughs> I think your, your tongue was wedged firmly, firmly in your cheek with that one. Um, I and... thought it was fight. The thing is, I ain't expecting to be fighting a man. Uh, so, <laughs> right, okay. it, it doesn't matter. I'm a terrible fighter. I'd get whooped in. Anyway. I was going to say, yeah. When, when, like, yeah either way. Um, also, and just finally, yeah, um, a quick hello from Tara Todd All right, okay. as well. I'm a new arrival to Glasgow. Yeah. Tara Todd. Welcome. Welcome to Scotland. Best city in the world. Yeah, yeah, welcome aboard. Uh, she, uh, again, to the announcement of the village, uh, said, yes, this was filmed right by where I grew up, and he lived in the area as well, so we take our M. Night Shyamalan movies very seriously around these parts. A Shyamalan defender. Yeah, a Shyamalite? You're, you're, you're creating the religion here. Yeah, I know, I keep making that's up these doing. weird Shyamalan collective nouns, don't I? I need to yeah. stop doing that. But that's just about it from the feedback. Keep getting in touch, we do love reading these things out. Uh, you can do it in a number of ways. Facebook and Instagram are both strong language violent scenes. You can tweet us, as many of you do, at PC. And you can't email us, which nobody's opted for us so far. I just delete them. I don't. Th- oh, come I on just now. straight delete them. Anything that's longer than three lines. Yeah. Anything that's it. longer than tweet. Yeah, that's it. I just no, no. You you were told. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, please do get in touch by email if that is your chosen medium. You can email us at stronglanguagevalentscenes at gmail dot com. And that just about does it for episode seven. Lousers. Seven. seven. Now we're looking down the barrel at episode eight. And uh, speaking of which, look out for uh, mini episode seven. That'll be coming your way on Monday. Monday. Uh, where we'll be announcing the guest and film for next week's episode. And we're going to have a, a, an in-the-studio guest. Yeah. Um, yeah, breaking the little Skype streak that we had going. Yeah. And uh, you have an in-the-studio guest, which I'm quite looking forward to. to be able to smell them. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how this works. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks as always for joining us. And don't forget... Don't tell anyone else of your burstings. Good night. <laughs> what a twist! You've been listening to Strong Language and Violent Scenes with Andy Stewart and Mitch Bain. Strong Language and Violent Scenes theme by Mitch Bain, production and artwork by Andy Stewart. Find us on Stitcher, iTunes, and Podbean.